Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for coming to this session in the midst of a pandemic with a quite historic presidential election around the bend. I don't think I really have to communicate the importance of understanding risk. And thankfully, we have a wonderful panel today. They are not only just top-notch scholars, but they're really thought leaders in terms of how we can measure risk. We have Scott Baker from the Kellogg School. Uh, Scott is an expert in how both households and corporations respond to income fluctuations and uncertainty. We have Jerry Hoberg from the Marshall School at USC. While Jerry writes very widely in corporate, I think he is really well known for his work in product market and disclosure research. He's also the recipient of many large NSF grants. And last but not least, we have Alan Moraria from the Simon School at Rochester. And Alan has spent a lot of time thinking very deeply about how volatility affects asset prices. So this is really just a top-notch panel, and I'm very excited about this discussion. The format today is going to be, I'll do a brief overview of where the literature is in sort of understanding, measuring risk. And then I'll turn it over to our panelists. Each one will have about 10 to 15 minutes to talk about their thoughts on risk and their recent work. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. My thought is that basically uh, hold questions, we'll have a big Q&A time, um, and you can either raise a hand or post a note in the chat box, okay? Without further ado, let's get going. So obviously all of us teach risk. We, if we're in finance, we're talking about it. If it's in the asset pricing side, the corporate side, we teach risk. But as far as risk in the academic research, what we've seen is a huge growth since the financial crisis. Just as a snapshot, I looked at the top three journals, so very not inclusive, but an idea. And before the crisis, we saw about 1,800 articles referencing risk. In the same period post-crisis, we saw almost 4,000 articles. But when we talk about risk, the question is, what is risk? Um, so I borrowed Cam's online glossary, and he references standard deviations, systematic risk, you know, things we would describe as beta, things that can't be diversified. But when we think about how people managers and the market thinks about risk is that, is it beta? Is it standard deviation? And just thinking like an economist, what's the, what are they thinking about? COVID, recessions, trade risk, climate change risk, reputation risk, commodity input price risk. And so we know that risk comes in many flavors and that it varies over time what is going to be more or less salient to the market and to managers. And so the reason I thought this would be an interesting panel is sort of as empiricists, how should we be thinking about risk? Just obviously even the term risk is a little narrow, right? I think the bigger term is uncertainty. And so when we think about uncertainty, we can think about what's the form of uncertainty. If there's risk, which we're where we have objective probabilities, as well as ambiguity or subjective uncertainty, what we call nightian. And these are very different constructs that have very different impacts on both corporations and markets. So we can think about what the form of the uncertainty is. We can also think about the content of the uncertainty. Big shout out to Laura's uh, 2018 JME, which went through this very nicely, but it could be micro uncertainty, at the firm level or even the household level if we're thinking about individuals, macro, aggregate or countrywide, and then disagreement, higher order uncertainty. So it's not just form and content, but another piece would be the horizon. And this is something I think really has not gotten that much attention in the literature. Maybe a little bit more Alan can tell us on the asset pricing side, but it really is, there are lots of elements to understanding uncertainty. So the question is, how, what tools do we have for measuring this if we're empiricists? Well, obviously we have corporate data. 
But within corporate data, we could think about risk and uncertainty in different ways. We could think about it as within firm changes over time, like cash flow volatility changes, or we could think about the dispersion across firms. Right? We could use market data, but then again, we have different choices. We have within and across the market choices. We also have choices between equity and the options. And so again, lots of options. Surveys, well, we have survey data from analysts. We also have survey data from executives. How do we know which one's the better choice? And even within sort of macro or country level, we end up with very disparate ways of approaching measuring risk. So the common macro uncertainty measure in Sydney's work is looking at aggregating like hundreds of finance and macro measures into one number. Whereas the Desai paper uses a much more, I would describe as qualitative measure of political risk at the country level, where they're actually thinking about religious tension, the influence of police in the political system, things like that, right? And so very different ways of approaching a risk measure. And then obviously we've seen a huge explosion in the use of textual analysis to give us more nuance and richness in our way of understanding risk. And the first four papers are all written by people that are on this panel, but they are people that are creating measures that are giving us new information, whether it's about product markets or financial instability, whether it's economic policy or more news options. But there are different ways of getting these measures. So we have a lot of tools and we know that there are different elements that we need to capture with these measures. But this is the point where I will turn it over to our fantastic panel. Um, why don't, Jerry, I don't know if you would mind starting the conversation, telling us a little bit about how you understand risk and some of your work on developing these measures. Sure, it'd be a pleasure if I can share my screen here. One moment. Okay, uh, hopefully this is showing up and in Perfect. full screen format. Wonderful. So Christine, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And also thank you um, for all of you for being here. I am very excited about this topic. I don't think of this topic as a backward looking one. Uh, there's a lot of history on the topic, but I think this is one where in a forward looking sense, uh, we as scholars need to do a lot more. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful work that has been done already, obviously. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I'd like to just give a quick big picture uh, way that I think about this question. And then I'm gonna briefly go through uh, three works that I've done in this area. Um, in the time I have, I'll, I'll give that a try. Okay, so um, in a big picture sense, this topic, you know, could not be more important to our area of financial economics or even beyond finance in economics because uh, really, as Christine pointed out, risk is everywhere and we've only looked at parts of it. You know, it's an asset pricing, corporate finance, households face risks, regulators face risks, even systemic risks. International, the world is becoming global more so than it was. Uh, this is still an incomplete list. But what I wanna suggest also is that I have a, a, a high level view of this. The way I think of it is that theory has gotten ahead of the empirical work a little bit on this topic because theory of risk, seminal. Uh, we've seen it in our PhD classes. We understand it very well. And, and I like to think of that theory as telling us that risks can really come in different flavors. And we got to really keep that in mind as we go through these measurement exercises, because once you understand a type of risk, it sort of gives you guidance on how you might try to measure it uh, very well. And, and I think of risks as being systematic. The asset pricing literature gets into priced risk and pervasive risks and such. Uh, there also can be systemic which is different from systematic because it's really about the whole system itself suddenly 
blowing up, if you will, uh, in a jump-like process. And then, of course, there's idiosyncratic risk, which we think of as diversifiable. But yet, it still matters because individual companies are exposed to it, and they themselves have to think about how they change their policies, even if investors can diversify it. So we have these types of risks. And then going even further, we have dichotomies out there. For example, um, there are risks that investors or agents in the economy might not even be aware of, and systemic risks uh, that face the economy are a key example. We might not even be aware of them right now. And of course, there are the ones that we are aware of, but yet they still matter because of inability to diversify and issues like that. And when you put all this together um, from a measurement perspective, uh, the issues run very, very deep and no one paper is gonna come close to getting it all here, but we can do better by working, working on projects like this. So the first um, paper I'm going to talk a bit about uh, is my work with Kathleen Hanley in the 2019 Review of Financial Studies, uh, talking about dynamic interpretation of emerging risks. So we're thinking about financial instability risks here, or we can think of uh, systemic risks in the financial sector. And, and this was really um, one of the most challenging measurement papers that I've ever written. And, and therefore I wanted to highlight it first, especially in this session, uh, trying to think about measuring risks as they're emerging, as we're just starting to learn um, that they might pose a problem for us uh, is, is a particular challenge because you, know, you can't really use uh, a lot of historic older data to, to solve this kind of problem. And we have to bring new tools to bear, uh, particularly things like crowdsourcing, trying to detect the signal fast um, in terms of measurement. So um, the, the idea behind this work is, is really that um, when systemic issues occur, like what we saw in 2008, is that they, they occur fast, but they, they don't occur in one day. So there is a buildup. So I'm highlighting in red here that you can think of there being three periods of time from a measurement perspective that we wanna look at, but the one in the middle is the crucial one where we can actually try to, before, you know, before Lehman goes bankrupt and everybody knows there's a crisis, can we actually try to learn about um, a risk before it becomes that bad? And we think of that as a transitional period. And the central premise of this research project is that uh, during that transition period, we can use crowdsourcing from what investors are doing to try to determine what risks are actually becoming very important because the idea is that if you watch the movie The Big Short, you would know that a segment of the population kind of sees the issue early um, and before the whole population sees it and they're gonna act. And can we crowdsource their trading patterns and, and crowdsource what, what banks are putting out there to tell us about their risk exposures to actually see these problems early? And, and so this was an NSF funded project. We, we thank the NSF for, for their generosity in making it possible. But um, what I wanna now kind of give you a glimpse of is, is what's interesting about this type of risk is that uh, if you look at this picture over time, uh, we can think about all of the types of risks that I talked about earlier can be thought of as you know, visually in a covariance matrix. So uh, idiosyncratic risk is something that affects few firms. So you think of these little blue uh, regions of the covariance matrix, they're kind of easy to diversify and um, they're there. But the uh, systemic risks that we think of in asset pricing are these pervasive, they're always there like value growth risk, market risk. They're always affecting some firms more than others. So you see them in the covariance matrix, they're relatively steady. And they're, these are things that we've had some really good successes in measuring, uh, for example, the Fama French factors and things like that. But what I wanna suggest is that if you think about systemic risk, it really has a different overall profile and that's why it's harder in my view to measure i welcome those who think it's easy i'd love to hear your perspectives but it's also important what, what i'm really thinking about with systemic risk are these these um, types of aberrations in the covariance matrix that are not always there they appear suddenly and they can grow and become very large very fast um, we can think about what happened even this year in terms of the COVID pandemic and, and the stock market behavior in March and April as a manifestation of this kind of unexpected large, um, you know, systemic risk 
uh, type exposure. So um, that's that's really what we are trying to measure here. And I'll, I'll give you a sense uh, briefly in, in su such little time. Ordinarily, I would need an hour and a half to try to get through this. But in one slide, um, this is how we approach the problem. So we're going to use natural language processing and we're going to crowdsource what risks are systemically important from the banks themselves. Banks tell us what risks they think are important because they file risk factors in their 10K. So that's step one, is we're gonna go and go to every single bank that files a 10K and harvest the risk factors. But the, the first challenge in measurement is that some of those risks are going to be idiosyncratic and only one bank might be uh, exposed to it. And that's not what we want because that does not really directly imply that the system itself can be unstable. If one bank fails, we can tolerate that. So in order to figure out which of the risk factors that are disclosed are systemically important, we have a second stage here in the analysis is that we want to do a topic model. And you can think of a topic model as, in, as really like principal component analysis using text or factor models to figure out which of the risk factors are pervasively disclosed across many different banks. And so we use this um, topic model LDA. Some of you may have heard of it. I don't have time to get into the details, uh, but it's like a factor model. But what we also realize is that the problem is not even solved at that point because um, what, we, what we really wanted to do in this study was to make it so that not only can we detect these red uh, explosions in the covariance matrix, if you will, but we wanna make them interpretable. We wanna use the natural language processor processing so an economist uh, can, you, know, you can inform them not only has the covariance matrix changed in a dramatic way, but here is the risk factor that's driving the change and it's interpretable. That was the real challenge in this project. And so to uh, in ensure interpretability, we actually had to add a third stage to the analysis using semantic analysis. Here we want to think about embedding technologies that some of you may have heard of. You can look it up later. Doc to VEC, word to VEC. Uh, more recently, models like Roberta and Bert uh, allow you to do this in an even more profound way, but we used it in, in this study here. And, and then we score every bank as to which of the important risk factors you have exposure to. Now, once you do that, you know, which bank is heavily exposed to mortgages and which one is more exposed to regulatory risk or other types of risk. You can now run a regression where you're trying to explain the covariance matrix using the risk factors. You're, you're, the dependent variable, if you will, is this matrix. And, and the right-hand side variables would include the factors that you pulled out of the 10 Ks. And what we found is that uh, if you look in time series, the ability of the risk factors pulled from those 10 Ks to explain with R squared, the actual covariance that you see in bank trading data. So now we're crowdsourcing trading activity from the investors as the left-hand side variable. And on the right-hand side, we have the, the risk factors that banks themselves were crowdsourcing the banks. Uh, we see that um, it hits eight sigmas of aberration relative to what's normal in the early period around 2005. Now 2005, who was actually thinking about um, the Lehman bankruptcy and, and mortgage failure, right? Well, the, the fact of the matter is, is our model was saying that there were people already likely trading in ways that are consistent with their having knowledge of this factor. But the proof of, of the pudding as far as measurement is that not only do we want to show you that we have a model that can make a spike occur in 2005, but the question is, can the model tell us if you were sitting in 2005, could it have told you what it was that, that the traders were really concerned about? And that is the hardest part of this problem in measurement is to make it interpretable. So here, what I'm showing you again in almost no time flat, uh, that we, we use the semantic filters and, and we used a regression analysis to decompose the covariance aberrations. And, and it shows you here in time series, which interpretable factors became very strong in the trading activity at what time. And you see that real estate risk already had many sigmas believe it or not, these are Z-scores. Uh, it's the amount of real estate risk trading was 200 sigmas higher uh, in 2005, 2006 
uh, relative to what it was in the early period, consistent with the, the movie The Big Short, uh, for example, that people were actually driving trading activity uh, early on. And, and you can see that the timing of when various risks became important are not always the same, right? Rating agency risks driving trading occurred later. Okay, so I have uh, just a, a few minutes left. So I, I wanna now just um, talk about a second research paper and I will end on time. I know Christine's gonna be mad at me if I don't. So um, the second paper I wanted to talk about is product market stability risk. Okay, so this is um, a paper that Christine mentioned. It was 2014 in the Journal of Finance product market threats and financial flexibility. And what I wanna suggest here is that we actually looked at whether or not, because we think of risk as the second moment, can you actually get the second moment of, of the market for products? And, and if the second moment is high, it means there's a lot of shift, a lot of change going on within the product market. So this research goes back to, first of all, some precursor work that Gordon Phillips and I had um, in modeling uh, product market competition by pulling out the item one uh, from the 10K, which is a firm's description of its products. In this earlier work, uh, we found that you can model the entire US economy of publicly traded firms in a spatial product market model that looks like a sphere and that certain firms, uh, every firm has a location. So you have, if, if a firm is there in isolation, it's like a monopolist. If two firms are spatially close together, it means that they have vocabulary that's very highly overlapping and that they're competing with one another, therefore very likely. And then you have other, other regions of the space where there's oligopolies. And the key here is that 10 Ks are issued every year. So we actually see this globe change from one year to the next. And measuring the extent to which firms are changing in any region is the second moment of the product market itself. You're, you're measuring the volatility of the competitive network, right? And, and that was really the goal of the 2014 article. And what we found were that there are some markets where basically firms never revise their products. So there's not a lot of product market risk here. They're extremely stable. And an example would be something like the uniform industry. Nobody changes uniforms. However, um, there are other product markets where there's very rapid turnover of the products in that space. And obviously you would think about tech firms in the late nineties having a lot of product market fluidity and therefore a lot of product market risk. Now, the, the concept of product market fluidity is interesting on many dimensions for those of you who study industrial organization, but I wanna focus on risk because that's the topic right here. And the idea is that if you are a firm in a region of the product market where there's a lot of second moments in the product market around you, that you should actually think about this as a risk because what it's telling you is that the firms around you are very agile in the product market space and they could move into your market at a moment's notice. And therefore you should not consider your, your, your product market itself as being stable, but you have to be cognizant. And so what we found uh, economically is that the firms that are in these very high movement markets, therefore take a very precautionary stance in their corporate finance policy. So they hoard cash, um, they keep their leverage ratios low and uh, issues uh, of that sort. So uh, I won't talk about a third project because I am out of time. Um, th those are really the two that I wanted to talk about here. So thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Christine. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Scott, do you wanna, uh, I think Jerry, you need to end sharing. Yes, uh, we'll do. And we'll move on to Scott. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, so thanks so much. Hopefully that shows up all right. Um, so I want to focus a, a little bit more just on the uh, on the kind of measurement piece. I think Jerry made some really good points about um, you know thinking about uh, you know some people call it like now casting or you know just more rapid sort of like forecasting and using available information that may have been a bit diffuse, um, often textual, um, and kind of constructing some interpretable index and, and hopefully doing so in a way that's rapid enough to enable you know policymakers, business leaders, households to kind of incorporate that, that information into their decision making in maybe a more um, rational way. Um, and so I want to talk about you know something that I've been working on with um, in particular with Nick Bloom and, and Steve Davis 
um, for a number of years now thinking about um, using kind of newspapers to measure uh, various things, kind of uh, our, our primary paper was using uh, newspapers to measure um, economic policy uncertainty. Um, and this is, this is a website here that we've um, kind of set up uh, as you know, a bit of a clearinghouse for, for some of this information of, of our own indexes and, and others. So you know, feel free to um, you know, use the data and um, as many others have. Um, what we do just you know, very briefly is um, you know, we are, we, at, at, at the time we were not as uh, conversant in machine learning as uh, Jerry was. Um, and so we took a much simpler approach, which is just looking at um, kind of major U.S. newspapers and looking at the fraction of articles that would discuss um, uh, kind of policy uncertainty. We would try to measure this by uh, articles that contained one of each of several um, uh, kind of um, uh, sets of terms. Okay, so a, a term about uncertainty, a term about the economy, a term about um, various uh, policy-related uh, concepts. And we would we would you know uh, construct the the fraction of each um, each month's articles that, that contain these terms. We would kind of normalize each paper's index, combine them into a monthly uh, into a monthly composite um, U.S. index. Okay, the idea here is really to capture something that is is basically trying to um, uh, measure uncertainty, measure a component of uncertainty that hadn't really been able to be measured. Um, just using the, the fact that lots of people were talking about uncertainty uh, more or less in, in different periods of time. Okay? The idea is that if newspapers, if people are um, you know, discussing uh, uncertainty a lot, that probably means that the fundamental underlying level of uncertainty in the economy is, is maybe high at that period of time. Um, as we keep updating this index, uh, you can see the scale has gotten a little bit more distorted over the past uh, uh, year or so. Um, as we've seen a tremendous surge in, in uncertainty, um, you know, surrounding the COVID and COVID-related policies. This is the, the index for the U.S. You can see you know, there, there are a number of spikes that occur, you know, maybe where you might think to some extent. So things like elections, especially first-term elections, where there's a change in the presidency, um, you know, financial crisis, various big uh, policy debates um, uh, over the past uh, decade or so, a couple wars, the Asian financial crisis, Black Monday back in 87, um, different things like that, okay? So um, the nice thing about using newspapers, and I would talk a little bit about what data we have now and, and, uh, and then also maybe some of the benefits of, of taking this approach. And I think it's a bit, uh, it's kind of a very accessible approach and among a number of other pros. Um, so far on the site, we, we've done this for about 25 countries or so, including our indexes and, and some others that we host or we've done jointly with others. Um, we have categorical data, and so uh, we can drill down not into just overall levels of uncertainty, but uncertainty about various topics. Um, we, one nice thing about newspapers is that we can go back in time. So we have historical indexes back to 1900 or before for um, you know, some countries. Um, there's, there's uncertainty metrics that you can uh, try to understand different financial markets. So not just, you can look at equity market uncertainty as we've done, or um, you know, uncertainty about you know, bonds, or it's very, just a very flexible kind of approach. Uh, and then increasingly, there's been a, a kind of a push to uh, move this, this textual analysis into a firm specific level, as, as Jerry's kind of done with 10K data. Others have done with, um, um, with, with, with uh, 10Ks, with um, earnings calls, um, basically with any other sort of systematic information released um, that was you know, previously a nebulous cloud of text and now using kind of increasingly accessible machine learning tools, you can, you can distill that into a quantitative index, okay? So, you know, if you have any country specific index, anything like that, um, you know, we're happy to talk about, you know, sticking it online. So, um, you know, why have we found newspapers to be interesting? And partly this is just me evangelizing this approach a little bit. Um, I, I do think that there are a lot of benefits here. Uh, one nice thing is that this methodology can be replicated fairly easily across different newspapers and in different uh, different countries, rather, and in different contexts. Um, I'm working on one that goes down to kind of a state level within the U.S. Uh, to to show you know intra intra U.S. Um, you know regional variation in in uncertainty about you know, various local topics. Um, another nice thing, I mean, relative to to just asking people about um, subjective levels of uncertainty with surveys, you know, nice thing here is that this data already exists 
for you know potentially decades or, or hundreds of years for some countries, where there are newspaper uh, archives online that are searchable. And it's not just that we can ask something going forwards or develop a new survey to ask about this, but there's this huge corpus of existing data that we can go back and mine. And I mean, this is true for some of these other uh, things, you know, 10Ks uh, and, and the like as well, um, but, is, but it's certainly nice um, um, in newspapers, and this might translate into countries, maybe more developing countries that have had newspapers for a long time, but maybe not systematic financial reporting um, at a firm level. Um, we can keep up to date and up to date at a very high frequency. So, you know, a couple of our measures are daily and we, up to, we release the data and just have it automated and running every day. Um, and so we can, you know, generate those things pretty easily. Um, it's pretty high frequency. So instead of quarterly or annual data, we can get down to weekly, daily, monthly, um, for, for most countries. It's very flexible. So uh, again, you know, instead not just measuring aggregate levels of uncertainty, but thinking about you know, monetary policy uncertainty or fiscal policy uncertainty or trade policy uncertainty, um, it's very easy to, to drill down into these categories just by you know, appending kind of a simple um, additional set of terms to, to potentially match to. And then finally, um, the access is relatively low cost, relatively democratic. Um, so, you know, instead of requiring like really high priced subscriptions to, to various things, uh, to various services, um, you know, some of these, some metrics that have come out are, you know, you need to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to get access to underlying data. Um, here, it might just be a newspaper subscription or, um, you know, an archive service that either a university already owns or that is, is relatively low cost. Um, and so I think that's a, a, a nice feature um, as well. It makes it easier for folks to kind of develop their own. So let me show a, a few different um, kind of views about you know, what we've done so far. And most of these just a, a few different graphs. Um, so this is, this is talking about some of the flexibility. Um, so here we were looking at uh, two, you know, just as an example, two different of our categorical uh, metrics for the US. Uh, one is about uh, healthcare policy uncertainty. The other is about defense or um, kind of defense policy uncertainty. And you can see that you know there might be some some common trends uh, among categories, but they're pretty distinct. Um, and so this the, the the ability to disaggregate can tell you a lot. Um, and we we go and apply this to say like which firms are responding to which components of uncertainty. Um, and this comes across pretty strongly that, you know, uh, defense contractors are responding to defense policy uncertainty and, uh, you know, vice versa for, um, you know, uh, healthcare companies and insurance companies. Okay. So here we see, you know, defense policy and, and uncertainty about defense policy kind of spiking around wars and, and terrorist attacks. Um, whereas, you know, there's a lot more uncertainty about healthcare policy when we're discussing the Affordable Care Act, you know, Obamacare in the U.S., or thinking about tr the, you know, previous attempt to reform the healthcare system in the U.S. back in the Clinton administration. Um, and thinking about, you know, more high frequency measures and, and being able to, to take this uh, data and, and you know, have it of use, be of use to, to policymakers in near real time, um, we can basically go and, and zoom in a bit on some recent years and looking at kind of COVID and the differential impacts of the uh, COVID uh, pandemic on um, some of these different categories. Um, and so you can see here that you know, I've highlighted trade policy as, as one of these things, you know, trade policy uncertainty was pretty much nil for many, many years um, in the US. There just hadn't been a lot of discussion. There was some around NAFTA, but other than that, it just wasn't really moving the needle. Um, and then we have this huge spike in 2019 around the trade war. Um, and you know, the various tariffs and kind of counter tariffs uh, going back and forth between uh, China and the United States. Um, and then COVID kind of starts to hit and you see a spike in lots of types of uncertainty, but a kind of a decline in trade policy uncertainty. So kind of COVID sucked all the air out of the room. Nobody was really too worried about you know, trade policy um, anymore. I mean, you might be worried about trade, but not really uncertainty about the trade policy. Um, and, in, and instead, you know, people started to be, you know, think about fiscal policy uncertainty, healthcare policy uncertainty, and uncertainty over, um, you know, what, what the Fed is going to do to support the economy. Okay. Um, and so I think that, you know, using a, a daily measure or a weekly or monthly measure here, um, kind of being able to update it uh, nicely leads, leads this to be a lot more approachable um, uh, to uh, policymakers and others. Okay, and then just kind of one last thing, you know, going even to a more high frequency domain, um, we're, we're try working with um, a couple other co-authors to think about extending this approach, um, again, like a very 
kind of straightforward word search type um, result, uh, word search type uh, methodology rather, uh, to the, the, the Twitter universe. Um, and so thinking here, not just about uh, types of uncertainty and measuring levels of uncertainty, but also kind of who is talking about uncertainty. This is something that Twitter gives us a bit more uh, of an ability to look at. You know, is it uh, business people and, and kind of corporations that are that are uh, worried about things or making statements of, uh, you know, about uncertainty? Is it policymakers themselves? Is it, um, you know, uh, people in the media, journalists, or is it kind of everyday folks? Um, and so I think that there's there's a lot of um, uh, scope for this kind of simple type of approach to be exported to lots of different domains, different countries, different contexts, um, and to have a lot of uh, utility in that way. Okay, so I think I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Scott. Alan? Oh, I'll stop. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christine, for the invitation. Thank everybody for, for coming. Uh, I guess I interpreted, you know, the mandate a little differently. <laughs> I'm happy to, um, so I think it's going to be highly complimentary what, you know, Gerd uh, talked about and Scott. So I'm going to be uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how to extract information from text. Uh, uh, so it's gonna basically drill down a little bit on what Gerd talked about and Scott, and it was some of my uh, recent work to highlight that. Uh, so, uh, so this very much like echoes, uh, you know, what Scott just talked about, you know, there's, you know, there's like this gigantic body of data out there up for grabs, right? And that can be great for measuring risk. It's great for measuring a lot of stuff, right? Uh, you know, newspapers, you know, political speech, regulatory filings, earnings calls is like, there's a lot of, lot of data, okay? Not just recent data, but you know, uh, you can go, uh, you can get digital machine readable data going back for like a hundred years, right? Or more. Uh, the, the unlike data often used by economists, this is ultra high dimensional and very sparse data, right? So we, we have to find a way to reduce, to make the, the, the dimensionality of this data to make it tractable, right? And there's different approaches and, that, and that's what I'm gonna uh, discuss. Uh, the promise is obviously that we can extract new information that is not in our, you know, in our quantitative measures. And, uh, you can perhaps start extract information that's much more timely and useful for now casting. And, you know, I think the biggest hope is that it can provide interpretability. That is what exactly people are thinking as prices soared and then crash, right? And not the exposed interpretation that we, we, we can give if you cherry pick, you know, some events. Uh, and of course, you know, measure risks that were not born in the economic data, but people were thinking about and are thinking about. So I think all those are uh, very relevant. Now, the literature has, you know, especially early on, and I think it's still very much dominated by the bag of words approach, right? That we basically reduce dimensionality by grouping words according to some predetermined criteria. Okay, that's very appealing. Uh, because it's it's simple, right? So once you bag it, right, you classify these words, you know, uh, then you simply count them, uh, and that's it. That's your measure. And now you're back on a low dimensional space, which is uh, very nice. So I think the the first, you know, people use a lot in early on the Harvard Dictionary, the Lugahan McDonald uh, uh, Dictionary, that to capture sentiment, like what words are positive, negative, what words review uncertainty. I think like Paul Tetlock, uh, J uh, JF on this is probably like a classic reference on, 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 of this approach. Uh, we can also like simply construct our own group, right? You just, you know, and that's very nice because it leads to clean interpretation, at least from my perspective, the, the person that built it is gonna be a challenge to convince the other that I didn't, you know, you know was too, careful about what did I pick, right? Because there's a lot of degrees of freedom, right? And that's gonna be a dilemma every time that you have a very high dimensional space that you're trying to reduce. The LEDA, which is the, you know, basically a, a fancy way 
uh, to do some, you know, uh, you know, as this, I could think as a structural principle and component analysis that you're, you're, you're doing, you know, it's very flexible, but still doesn't quite get you the interpretability that you want because you need a lot of, uh, often what comes out is not uh, completely clean. I think there's a lot of nice work on that. For example, I really like uh, this uh, Jagadesh and Wu, you know, uh, Ger, Ger paper is also really cool that apply this, but they all have to like have one extra step to, to get some interpretation out of the data. Another approach is to use what I call supervised learning, right? Which is basically a very big regression, right? Um, and, you know, my, my paper with Azaf that Christine cited is an example of that. You basically there, we, we had a clear target. We wanted to like uh, find words that are related with uh, implied volatility VIX. Uh, and then what happened? Okay, my background changed. That's okay. So, um, and then we basically project VIX on the word counts on, on the Wall Street Journal, which is a very big space, right? You cannot just uh, run OLS regression because this is the number of uh, words is much larger than the number of observations. That's very representative of the problem that researchers uh, face. And people have, you know, there's like a lot of methodologies out there uh, and they're ever growing. I don't think we should be particularly as, as economists particularly enumerated with any of them, we should like dynamically, uh, you know, uh, change because this is a very fast uh, uh, field. So um, in that paper, we use support vector regressions, but there's other uh, stuff that is being, uh, being done. So just to, to show what is kind of like the output of this, basically, you know, typically you have some training sample. Uh, here's in these blue dots, okay, that we're training VIX. There's a test sample where, you know, data that you never show to the model that you're trying to uh, evaluate how well it does. And there is some, uh, you know, out of sample that is basically the insight that this forecasting uh, is giving you. So here we are like back casting VIX over a period that there was no options to try to get at uh, uncertainty, right? And you see what, what the basically output is basically some prediction and some weights that allows you to map, you know, the actual realization of words in the text versus you know, uh, the, the realization of words that are relevant for the particular value of interest, right? So you, you're, you're kind of doing, uh, instead of like having a view on what measure uncertainty, you are letting the data speak, so to speak, okay? Uh, the key challenges are uh, you know, three, and that's for any measure that you construct, right? And, and that's certainly representative of the uphill that we faced to publish this paper that you know, first draft was 2012. It took like five years to convince people that this is useful. So uh, first is validation, right? How do you, me how do you know that you measure, you, you, your measure capture something that, you that, that is, is what you want to capture, right? If you look like other measures, then you don't need yours, right? If it's different, then how do you know that you're doing anything useful? So and the key question is, can you, is like, can you answer a question that the people could not answer before, right? And that's the, the I think Scott put it up very nicely. And that's the, you know, that's how you have to, you, it, we should have new measures, but you always have to be, you know, your driving force is like, there is this question here and I can't successfully answer which we currently have. And that, that makes gonna make your navigating the publication process uh, easier. Uh, so um, now stability, you know, that's always gonna be an issue for any empirical method. For text, you know, for high dimensional stuff is even more because uh, stability issues are gonna be frog the center. You know, in particular, you know, uh, in the context of test, you know, strong Germany often means something very different today versus the event in the thirties, right? And if you estimate your, you know, your regression as sample, there is no financial crisis. You can easily think how it's not going to capture something about uh, the relationship of financial factors with uncertainty, right? So uh, in the end, this is an empirical matter, right? There is no, there is no theory that's going to sort this out, right? You're going to have to convince by showing how your, your, the quality of your prediction changes over time. And I think the, the, the biggest hope and the, is still the biggest challenge is interpretability. 
In the end, we have some output of vector weights that uh, in a prediction of a variable of interest. It does not tell the story by itself. You're gonna need some intervention. You're gonna, now we have some hope with semantic learning uh, uh, algorithms like BERT is, uh, is really cool. Azaf now has new work applying BERT that is like really, uh, really nice, but still it requires tons of fine tuning and still lots of degrees of freedom. So I think um, we're still kind of a little bit off from like being able to let the data speak and, and, and be clearly interpretable uh, in terms of like uh, just use a methodology and we can, uh, you know, I think there's too many degrees of freedom still even using uh, these methodologies. But, so, but I think that that's, uh, is, is, a, is a key challenge as well. So uh, how many minutes I have? I think I, I lost completely track of time. <laughs> okay, you can take a few more minutes. How, how many? Uh, <laughs> How's five like, more so, minutes? Five? Okay, cool. Because uh, I, I didn't time it. It's okay. So uh, the, the, I want to talk about then about like basically advertise this paper that I have with Brian and Azaf uh, because we built this uh, HDMR uh, uh, methodology that is, is, is designed to handle uh, prediction problems that feature text and also many you know, quantitative variables. Okay. So it's designed to deal with the sparsity of text data and uh, is very easy to use, okay? So uh, in the paper, we apply to different tasks. We backcast financial intermediary leverage, we forecast macroeconomic variables, and we measure political uh, polarization. So it's very uh, versatile. And um, so I, I just wanna show a little bit what the method does, and then advertise you know, the code that we have in GitHub if people want uh, to use, okay? So, Here's the regression that we would like to run, right? We have some variable of interest, V, I, Y, right? And that's what we would like to forecast and, and find the association with text. But we have a lot of like other variables that are not text related, right? That picks up uh, uh, this variable very, very well. For example, realized volatility would be a really good predictor for uh, implied volatility. So this method allow us to jointly estimate the covariance between a text and uh, the variable of interest after you control for this quantitative uh, covariance, okay? That's what we would like to run, but you cannot run this regression. So what we're gonna do is build on this math Teddy approach that's this inverse regression, where you know the genius of it is that now you run a regression of the, each word count on the variable of interest, and that gives you this sufficient reduction projection. It's basically you transform all the richness of text data in basically one time series, which is the relevant for the variable that you predict. And then you get back to like a variable that a regression that is basically, uh, you know, multivariate, but it's like the dimension uh, is uh, small, right? We just run a regression of the sufficient reduction projection that encodes all the information in text and the variables that you want to control for, okay? So what we do and, you know, to basically adapt this methodology for text is to uh, have a selection equation that treat the, the, uh, the fact that text is particularly sparse. And, uh, and basically you have a, a both extensive and intensive margin on this, uh, on this method, and that turned out to, to make a, a big difference for text data, okay? So um, one thing that we do, this is like backcast intermediary leverage. There's a lot of interest on uh, you know, financial intermediary leverage, here's exactly the inverse of intermediary leverage, but, you know, we don't have uh, uh, that much, you know, data starts in the 70s, so this allows you to basically uh, backcast that uh, and uh, to see, and, you know, and using the methodology, you can get very large in reductions in root mean square error, uh, uh, in particular when uh, the sparsity of the text is high. The second thing that we do in this in this paper is uh, look at partisanship, you know, and that's uh, building on the you know uh, the classic work by Gens Shapiro. They use congressional speech to show that you can tell a story of partisanship by just seeing how frequently uh, the words of Republicans and Democrats, uh, how frequently are the different words that they use. Okay, and that's basically this uh, blue line here that they find and they find that, you know, participation has been very high recently, but has been high during the tourists. And some, you know, scholars, you know, political, they just, they disagree whether this was really high in the tourists or not. So if you separate these two margins, the extensive and intensive margin with our methodology, 
you see that uh, that actually the the, the partisanship today is kind of very unique and different from what happened before, right? Because now there's not just segmentation about how intensively you talk a particular issue, there's completely segmentation language, right? You know, Republicans, Democrats use just different words for, for stuff, okay? Uh, and then uh, last uh, is about macro forecasting, okay? So I don't have time to go to this table, but that's like a very traditional exercise. And, you know, obviously uh, you could also throw uh, uncertainty here um, as well, okay? So now uh, why I'm talking about that and why I'm talking so fast is because it's all ready to use, right? There's a GitHub page. If you Google Azaf Manela uh, and go to his website, and he put like really well documented a uh, uh, page that uh, you know teaches you how to install, how to do everything. Okay, you have to use Julia, but now you can use even use Python and emulate Julia uh, through Python. That works as well. Okay, but there is no uh, Azaf is not offering technical support at this time, so you're gonna have to figure out if something doesn't work. Okay, but you know the big picture. You know, tax data is exploding in variability. Uh, I think they're using economic. You know, there's a lot of interesting stuff, but still very early. There's a lot of new methodologies, and we ought to be flexible and explore uh, this methodology. I think interpretability is the big payoff. I don't think it's achieved yet, but I think that's the the highest gradient that we we should be working on. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Okay, so we have heard from three experts and now we have time to sort of chat as a group. So there is a chat box. If you're in the audience and you have questions for the panel, feel free to pop it in the chat box or raise a hand um, and we'll go from there. But let's just, while we're getting started, so Scott and Jerry, obviously, Alan talked a lot about sort of validation and going through the process of convincing early audiences of, your measures. Did you both have similar experiences or do you have recommendations to people who are thinking about trying to create different proxies? Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, that was definitely one of the big um, challenges we had was, was, and that was actually out of those six slides in my, uh, in my uh, slide deck that I didn't get to was all about, you know, do, can we actually extract anything meaningful from this? Um, and I mean, we took a couple, you know, approaches, a couple that are, uh, you know, we, we appealed to some correlations with things that we think should be correlated and kind of other stuff like that. But I mean, the main thing was a bit more labor intensive and involved like reading 10,000 articles or having, you know, ourselves and RAs uh, read like 10,000 plus articles and kind of coding up whether they were actually about policy uncertainty or not and um, kind of making a, a human version and a computer version and they seem to overlap quite, you know, substantially. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, um, I, I think that, you know, one nice thing about our approach is, is it is a bit, there's kind of no black box in some sense that it, that is very yeah. straightforward. And that has some weaknesses in terms of, of you know, the, the, the number of dimensions which we can kind of incorporate and the level of nuance that we can incorporate. incorporate. Um, but I, I think it does maybe make it a bit more uh, approachable to, to, to some folks as well. Absolutely. So you know, let me just uh, reinforce, I, I agree with uh, the perspectives that, that have been shared here and I, I wanna reinforce them, but I, I would note that um, some of the earlier works that I've done in this area, take for example, the work on industry classification. We actually started that research in early 2006. Uh, the first publication came out in 2010, but uh, in a sense, the first paper we wrote was published in 2016. You can see a very long uh, time horizon there, and, and I see uh, Alan uh, nodding. Uh, this is the <laughs> this is the way things have been, but I don't think that this will be the way they will be, and it shouldn't be the way that they will be. And part of the the problem is, um, you know, back then you really have so many new things that you have to put into that paper that people are going to say, "Well, I haven't seen that before. We want to understand it." And of course, that's going to create a protracted process. Where these days, and in, in recapping. Um, I do actually referee a large number of papers in this area and I submit papers and I see how other people referee my work and, and, and it's hard to generalize so don't take a lot of this with too much weight 
but I, I think that a paper that has novel substance to it as far as what you're trying to measure, it's a risk measurement paper or something that, you know, is novel in that sense, that comes with some validation where, as was articulated earlier, you know, we expect the results to be really strong here and we test it and it is. Um, and so uh, when you have the validation and you have the novel idea and then you also have the relevance that was also articulated, it can't just be I measured something new and it looks like it's validated. We have to show that it matters. Um, if you have work that satisfies all three of those criteria, I would not expect that you would have a 10 year refereeing process. And, and of course, we really want to see work uh, that goes as close to those uh, ideals as possible because we need it. Absolutely. Well, I think that's very useful for people who are starting out or thinking about getting into this area. Now, obviously, each of you discussed sort of the benefits of using text, whether it's from a 10Ks or whether it's from the newspapers. When we think how we're doing this, obviously, you're making a choice that that's a the piece of information you find is most salient. How, as empiricists, do we think I need to be thinking about a risk proxy that uses news, or I need to be thinking about a risk proxy that uses 10Ks, or you know, market from the uh, news from the equity markets. How do we sort of balance all these choices of different places where we can measure risk and uncertainty? I mean, I can speak to that a bit. I think it depends on on basically what your goal is, uh, I think very much as a segmentation in the in the market for information. Uh, and then if you wanna think about, you know, the type of information that is about the broad, you know, uh, public, then you probably don't wanna be looking at 10Ks uh, because it's public information, but, you know, there's no such a thing, I think, as public information. You know, there is salient information, less salient information. And I think uh, if we're going to look uh, in 10 cases, it's going to be something much more specific and related to uh, to trying to measure the beliefs so either of managers or accountants and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, you always have to have in mind uh, kind of like what is the there's no such thing as a representative investor. So you want to try to think about who, who, who you're trying to get into the head off. I think that that's how, how I think about this. Um, yeah. Good. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, all of these, the, there's kind of a giant new universe of text as more things get digitized and everything. And I think it's important to, you know, for folks to, you know, aim for, you know, not necessarily just the look under the, the lamppost or where, you know, where it's easiest to get text, but you know, think about what, what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to measure. Um, that you know, they're generating some index from from you know the different sources is going to yield you know some commonalities, but but some differences, and it's just important to be at least kind of aware uh, of of you know what those what those differences might be in terms of who who's doing the writing. You know, do you want to use the Fed minutes, or do you want to use 10Ks, or do you want to use newspapers, or you know whatever else? Um, they're going to give you slightly different pictures, and and um, you know one. One's going to be more applicable than the other, maybe, to the question you're trying to ask. So, if I can just add a quick comment, uh, you, you all, I agree. I, I would just add one thing that I like to continuously do when in this stage of a research project where you're trying to formulate the ideas. First of all, I, I reinforce heavily that having some uh, little bit of theoretical guidance to say what, whose head do I want to get into and what's going on inside that head to kind of really shape what you're going to expect to see when you get into these textual corpora. But the, the one thing I would emphasize even more is that every stage, at this early stage in particular, that I actually spend a lot of time reading um, the corpus that I think is the right one. And I want to see a lot of evidence and just casually picking these things up that the types of conversations that I predicted would be there would actually be there. And then as you get into your measures and you're starting to measure it, you want to keep having it dump out the data that you're loading heavily on and then keep reading that and say, did I actually um, score highly the things that, that should be there? Yeah, if I could respond to that, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's a really great point, and that's something that um, you know my father Steve Davis talks a lot about. That you know the especially as we get into more uh, you know detailed, more nuanced, more complex uh, kind of machine learning approaches, that we still need to discipline them a lot. You know potentially with with 
the knowledge that we have, right? He's, he often talks about like, look, we're, we went to school for a long time to be economists, to like think about things and think about, uh, kind of understand maybe what what's kind of important and what's not. And so, you know, we don't have to be completely neutral in the sense of like just blindly running, you know, algorithm X, um, but we should really kind of incorporate the knowledge that we've, we've you know, gained over years of, you know, reading lots of nice uh, econ papers and finance papers. Um, so I think that that's, that's useful to put into to, you know, these, um, these approaches. But beyond sort of the focus on all these great text measures that we have, Scott, if I'm remembering correct, you have a new paper that's using lots of different places of information from implied volatilities and text and the Twitter all in one. Did you, what was sort of the thinking behind that approach? Yeah, so there we were basically trying to um, uh, just talk about some of the pros and cons of different measurement methods. So, you know, thinking about surveys versus, you know, using Twitter versus newspapers versus implied vol. And, and you know, a lot of it is about what was kind of in the discussion of the kind of discussing the context of COVID and thinking about very rapid shifts in, um, uh, in sentiment, in economic activity, in uh, uncertainty, um, and thinking about like how quickly some of these metrics pick these up and, and you know a lot of that depends on the granularity and, and how, how high frequency they are but also about you know are, are these metrics kind of more forward looking or backward looking yeah. um, so I think again that goes to kind of you know these textual measures can be great and they can allow a lot more dimensions of, of analysis and, and measuring things that we couldn't previously measure but there are, there are a lot of applications in, in which you know it we have already great metrics and we don't maybe we don't need to new, make a, a, a new measure for it. Yeah. Well, what I've heard from sort of, I think all of you is sort of the need to think not only what do I have, what tool do I have, but what question and what theory is guiding this process. And one of the things Jerry had mentioned when he started his talk was how he felt the theory was ahead of the empirics when it comes to measuring and understanding risk. But on somehow there's sort of a disconnect, I think, between how theorists think about risk and uncertainty. It's very big, broad. And a lot of the measures we're seeing developed are very specific and precise, whether it's trade uncertainty or product market fluidity, but they're very uh, specific questions where you're getting into, you know, very interesting questions, but it's less connected to kind of how I see the theory literature having developed. Do you guys agree or disagree? If, if I may, um, I, I think that uh, adding on to your point is that maybe uh, you're right that while the theory is ahead, the theory is not done. So seeing more theory bringing into, if you will, the measurement. So the theory that we do have is very profound on understanding the trade-offs that investors have to make when they face risk. Um, when we think about systemic risk, systematic risk versus idiosyncratic risk, you know, in the PhD class goes back to 1970s. It's extremely, extremely established. But but the theory goes a little bit less, and there, it's not there's not a vacuum. So um, you know, Gary Gorton and Ite Goldstein have a number of really interesting papers that get into the disclosure part, and I think of that as the theory that now crosses that bridge to uh, the original theory, which is about the portfolio choice, to now what you're going to expect to see in the public domain. So it's there. Uh, so I think we got to respect that theory more and, and, you know, think about it before we get too deeply into a specific measurement process. But indeed, um, more work can be done there. And I want to add, why, why, do I, why did I mention this in my talk? Why do I think it's extremely important is that there is a risk with using methods like a lot of them that have been discussed here, including ones that I use. The, the key risk is really the concept of overfitting. You have so many degrees of freedom here. Uh, if you if you search the data too much, you will find something that will matter. What is the best counterpoint to that so that we don't do that as, as scholars? Because that's that can cause damage to the literature. And to me, the you know the, obviously we can raise the T stats. Uh, Cam Harvey has some very nice work in in that domain. But the other response is that if you find a result for which there is no theory, um, we we should be a little bit more skeptical. Uh, as to its validity. Okay. Any other comments, Scott or Alan? Yeah, uh, I think there's different types of theory. There's theory about like aggregate risks and how that 
you know, defines what risk is from the perspective of what is priced, right? So that's like hardcore asset pricing. I think that's well understood. It doesn't work very well in the data. And, and then I don't know if that's a measurement problem. Sounds maybe it is for like disaster risks and long run risks. Uh, and there's a lot of, there's like my work tried to get at this disaster risk. There's a lot of work that tried to use tax analysis to get at long run risk. It's challenging. Um, I, I think, you know, there is some connection. People try to connect, but uh, it doesn't mean that if there's not other tier, it doesn't mean that it, you know, I think it's like we, they, they feed back in each other, right? We go, we find puzzles, and then we go and write theories that explain these puzzles and we probe them again. And so that's like keeps going. And uh, hopefully it's progress. It's not clear that's all it is, but you know, hopefully we progress that way. And there is like, uh, like other risks that are more like firm level and just syncretic and all this. And that's, I think it's much more uh, connected. I mean, we are measuring specific uh, examples, but you know, like corporate finance has, you know, has in the last 20 years produced a lot of like uh, different, uh, you know, type of risk that, you know, should uh, matter for the firm uh, and for their, you know, how they manage stuff and so on and so forth, their capital structure and the investment policy. And I think this, the, there, there's a, a tighter uh, connection there. I don't think the fact that this is now uh, in the management necessarily like break down from, from theory, I think, um, in this sense, I don't know if it made much sense on that. Uh, sorry. No, <laughs> so I think you're on to something, which is, my, this is thought. something I kind of wanted to say, kind of have us all mull over, which is, you know, which one, which risks are the most salient? We know we're getting more risks identified. We know they're loading and regressions and they have predictive power and they're interesting, but it's kind of, when we think about what the theory says as far as, you know, I'm approaching this from a corporate researcher perspective, but if we think about, you know, corporate risks, what they are and which ones are most relevant. How do we get our hands around that? Which ones, and then also which sources of information provide us the best measures of risk? You know, is it the journalists? Is it the equity markets? You know, how do we understand both the source of information and also which risks are most relevant yeah, I, th I mean, I think that, you know, s some folks have, have tried to go down this route and, and, you know, you can, you can, it's a nice thing about text and also the curse of textual analysis is the high dimensionality, right? So you can have kind of an infinite number of, of kind of primitive, you know, sources of risks. Um, you know, you can allow that, that uh, to, to kind of increase without bound, essentially, or up to the limit of your, you know, computational power or, or your, your corpus of, of, or text. Although um, Alan's going to get us around all those computational issues. We are <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So then we it's are, yeah, completely unbounded. Yeah. Um, but but you know that then it, some folks have then gone the other way and say all right, we have we start with this, you know, high dimensions and then you know you can take any any number of methods to get like a principal component type you know, uh, approach to get down to like these are you know these distinct risks facing these sets of firms or you know this different periods of times. Um, so again, I think it, you know, depends on, on the question, how, you know, how, how detailed do you want to get? How disparate do you want to get? I mean, you know, theory is by its nature, you're, I mean, I guess you can, like a lot of the standard theory, you know, is pretty, um, has stark, uh, has, has fairly stark formulations of, of risk at, you know, an aggregate and idiosyncratic level. And, you know, maybe the fact that these are, you know, time varying, or then there's, you can have every level of, you know, industry and sector and various other components of risk as well, um, kind of comes naturally out of the data, but, you know, has to be then more baked into the, 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 the theory components. Okay. Jerry, anything or? Yeah, so, um, you know, the choice of, should I look in newspapers, should I look in 10Ks, and the concept of, is there one uh, you know, most important risk. First of all, uh, is there one most important risk? I think that, that the answer is absolutely, I, I don't like to think that way at all. I, I respect that um, sometimes something is a little bit more important than somebody, something else. But well, I you think don't that the, have any more papers yeah. to write if you had already found all the right risk <laughs> yeah. measures, right? <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, if, you, if you're driving into the office, there's probably 20 bad things that can happen to you. And if I only tried to think about the one bad thing, 
I probably wouldn't make it to the office every day. I got to actually worry about all 20. And, and I sort of think about things that way. And now, therefore, now you say, well, okay, should I be a researcher who cares about newspapers or, or 10Ks or whatever? Is that when you're, when you're going to, you know, make a claim as a researcher, I want to work on, you know, number 13 or whatever number, that's a nice, uh, scary number, number 13, <laughs> that, uh, that you have, you, I would say, well, then you got to go to the theory, okay, why should number 13 matter? What kind of trade-offs going on in the economy that would amplify it? And so uh, to take an example of a research project that is not mine, um, thinking about some of Alan's work in terms of newspapers and higher frequency, um, you know, when, what, when might I choose that? Um, what, what I like about uh, that way of thinking in, in that research is that um, when I think about, um, you know, first principal component risk in financial markets like VIX, and that's how I, I think about it, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the theories as to why these things matter go back to some of the most seminal, even the CAPM, that, you know, um, that you have this first principal component and everybody's so afraid of it, they're going to change their in in investment behavior. But one thing I really like about those theories that, that convinces me that he made a good choice here is that, and it's overlooked by so many people discussing papers when I see in, in this area, is that in order for a systematic risk factor to really matter, it has to be the case that everybody in the economy knows about it, or at least a majority, right? Because the cap M, for all its limitations and oddities, it is a general equilibrium model. And a general equilibrium model requires as an assumption that people understand the distribution of returns. It has to be therefore something that would be visible to, if you will, the average uh, person in the economy would have to know about it. And what better uh, way to think about that is in the newspaper. Uh, indeed, um, the person across the street from me who is not a finance professor reads the newspaper. And if I'm seeing a lot of evidence of first principle component risk in the newspaper, I kind of buy a little bit more that, um, that there's a link to systematic risk here. It's not an idiosyncratic, it may not be systemic risk, um, where, like I said, I've done some work on, I think it was systemic risk. Um, there, I think the key issue is that it's more of a needle in the haystack, that if it was in the newspaper, you've already had Lehman's bankruptcy and it's too late. So I did not want to look at newspapers there. But my theory was that, look, I think that there are people who have information, but they're kind of um, trading on it and, and for their own personal gain, but they're not putting it in the newspaper. So you got to look somewhere else to, to find the signal. Very nice. Any... Well, audience, obviously feel free to chime in either in the chat box or raise your hand if you have questions. But if not, just going off of Jerry's last point as far as the distribution, obviously we are in the land of COVID. So that brings up distributions and fat tails. Alan, I know you do work in tail risk, disaster risk. Ha has COVID changed the way you think about risk or did you see it coming all along? Right, yes. I saw it coming, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm incredibly well wealthy right, right now. And I'm giving my talk from my airplane that is flying above the country. No, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it is tricky. I don't know if I have... Um, I think, you know, what text can give you. I mean, I think, uh, you know, this early warning approach that Garrett's talking about, I think is obviously very useful. If you can get text from, uh, you know, like uh, hedge fund letters, right? I mean, that's very useful, right? It's like how the hedge funds are explaining to investors how they're positioning themselves. And maybe you can get an early peek on what is, uh, you know, what are the, you know, the, the key things that people are thinking about. But you know, for, from very salient public data, that's going to be very, uh, very hard uh, to do. You know, I think the text, uh, you know, these methods just don't have nuance today to pick up things that you wouldn't be able to pick up with your, you know, eyes. Right? I think what they do is try to like systematize that, right? Instead of like, because it's impossible for you to go and start reading uh, the newspapers and say, oh, here people are really concerned with like wars and so on and so forth. So now this allows you to, to you know, put structure and do that for you. I think they, that's what the type of uh, 
what these methods uh, allow you to do. It's not, it's not extract new information that you wouldn't be able to recover if you were just like reading the newspaper, right? Uh, so I think, uh, so in that sense, I don't think it would be able to, to give you, um, uh, you know, better insight um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, of course, but it's useful to formalize this, right? And I think that's how this, uh, why, how these measures are, are can can be, how these methods can be useful is to formalize that people were thinking about these things at different uh, points in time. Now, to to tail risk a little bit, I think it's important. Uh, I think, you know, one thing that, you know, drove us to write the new implied volatility paper is that economists tend to be very condescending, you know, and they look back and they tend to say, oh, people were crazy, right? They were just nuts. Why they were thinking that? That's obviously implausible, right? Uh, of course, they do that with the benefit of hindsight. So it's very important to like go back and try to see how people perceived their risks at the time to be able to like realistic entertain uh, at least the distribution of theories in people's heads. And maybe that's the relevant one in, after all. I mean, uh, it's very hard to get at P anyways, you know. Um, so I think that's- So all. you're saying in real time, you would wanna see me when I had my shovel in my front yard, digging a moat around my house as like COVID was breaking out. That's what you're looking for with your measures. Cause I was pretty close to that for a while. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you know, if, if anything, I think, you know, that these kind of, some of these tail risks kind of show some of the limitations potentially of, of these textual measures, especially the, the higher dimensional ones. It, like you mentioned a concern of overfitting, and this is kind of precisely the realm in which we worry the most about overfitting is kind of a new type of shock. A new category of risk arises, which we had not trained our data on at all, um, and, and that you can get, you know, a... That, that like, you know, if you didn't have any COVID terms or if you had a very specific term set um, or something like that, that, that you had to, to kind of map to. Um, and this is now there's a bunch of new terms related to risk uh, that, that kind of come into the English language. Um, you know, if you were if you were doing everything based on data up to 2020, then you might, you know, miss that essentially. Um, so I think it does, you know, just kind of bring up some of that and you see that especially in like the political realm where there's like a new policy or a new term for a policy mm -hmm. um you know thinking about the you know as we previously talked about like the you know disparate terminology for for maybe the same policies or for the same concepts uh by by members of different parties and so you know depending on what you're training on and how language evolves over time you have to be really careful to kind of incorporate some of that or allow that flexibility to to continue your measure being being kind of relevant. So can I make a different point about, um, you know, living through the COVID experience and sort of it's changed my view on, on research in a, to me, a personally profound way. I don't know if you all agree, so I'll just throw it out there. And, and for, for observation is that I think that um, now a lot more than I used to that we as researchers have really a severe agency problem in how we do research in terms of thinking about when COVID came and what we all actually did and what I thought would have been socially optimal is that um, I think that we all work for institutions and all of our institutions um, do believe in, you know, helping society. Okay, so um, the idea is that in, all of our deans would probably say, yeah, if you said, if you asked your dean, you know, can I contribute in a major effort with 50 researchers, while I probably won't get a publication uh, that you can put on the business school's name, but as, as, a, as a unit, our team is going to really, um, you know, provide something that is extremely substantive to inform regulators and, you know, the leaders of our various nations about what's going on in a very timely way, in a very accurate way. I think all of our deans would actually want us to do that. But what I actually um, saw, and, and it, it's actually with, with no, um, disrespect at all meant to anybody who has researched COVID in, in what has actually occurred. So they've actually seen some very nice, clever papers on COVID. But I think that what actually occurred is we all felt that call. We all wanted to do something to help out. And, and everybody just called up their favorite co-author and said, let's go try to hurry up and write a paper and be um, early and get it to the press uh, so that we can you know, publish and claim victory in our, in our way. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the, what's, what's lacking there is, is a lack of um, working together 
So I, I don't, I'm not proposing a solution yet, but it's just something to think about. So suppose, for example, that um, five groups all wanted to do textual analysis on COVID. Okay, what if they had a website where they, they publicize, you know, we're team number one, we're going to do this, and two is going to do this, but then we're going to compare and, and take the best of it all and uh, put something like that out there uh, for the public. And so the idea is that there's a timeliness when, when something like COVID happens, we all want to help. We got to do it quickly. Um, there is, I think, a superior outcome that would be associated with pooling resources rather than staying in silos. And, and it really is sort of an agency problem because it's the, the way that you know, researchers are rewarded by their schools is a model that's very individualistic. And so uh, that sort of um, changed uh, the way uh, that, that I think about it a little bit more. And, and it actually harkens back a little bit to Antoinette Shore who had a very nice keynote in the WFAs about, we often have a lack of consensus because we like to debate and, and nitpick with one another, but sometimes uh, the, the uh, pressure is on that we, want to, we should try to find consensus um, so that we can actually be louder in terms of what we, we think we can contribute as a group. Um, that, that's too philosophical maybe, so I'll stop there. <laughs> No, I think that is a really nice contribution and a nice way to think about not only how people responded to this event, but going forward how, you know, we're all now well-versed in Zoom but in virtual conferences, but how people can collaborate and think about working together and obviously thinking about the incentive systems either at the school level or at the journal level, how organizations that publish can think about encouraging people to be more collaborative in a way that would be productive. Um, so I think that is very well considered. Um, one of the things you mentioned was sort of, you know, contributing. And one thing we haven't talked about is sort of the, either the dialogue between academics and practitioners or between academics and regulators and whether or not we should be more linked in our discussion of how we understand risk and how firms and the markets respond. Does anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, recently I was in, you know, I have a paper on, on COVID about the corporate debt market. And uh, recently I was in a, you know, uh, a board meeting from associated with the G20, right? Which was basically all the industry big shots and they have a very clear agenda. And I had no idea what this group, they invited me and I come there parachuting, right? And theoretically, I should be the voice of like, against the industry lobby, right? It was me plus people in some think tanks, but the industry people come extremely, extremely polished with a point to make, to distort the data, to like shape the Fed thinking. You know, they releasing some information, but they're also shaping according to their preferred narrative of the events, right? And there, I felt that sometimes, you know, powerful that, you know, perhaps I could make a difference, but on the other hand, feeling like I failed my job because I, I didn't realize and I didn't like prepare, you know, something to like be able to like really speak, uh, you know, I don't know if truth to power is the word, but you know, like give the, you know, that, that would be my role, right? I know this, I researched it. I can actually put some facts on the table regarding this. So I think there's a role for it. I think I didn't perceive as valuable at all ex ante, right? And I think it's a failure on me, right? I got this invitation and I was like, okay, I should say yes, but, but I had no idea what, you know, what I was getting into and maybe I should, uh, yeah. I, I, don't I know. can't wait for the next time you end up in one of these meetings. Yes. Yeah. You're going to be exactly. ready. <laughs> Hopefully. I mean, I, I, I was actually going to say, you know, I'd push back on that a little bit, at least relative to other academics. I think, you know, people in finance and econ kind of business school and kind of fields, I think they do a bunch better job of, you know, presenting research to policymakers. There's a lot more informal links, a lot, lot more kind of interaction, going, giving talks, you know, people from, from you know, regulators engaging in research alongside co-authoring with, um, you know, academic faculty. So I, I think in general, we do, you know, pretty good job. I think Alan makes a good point that, you know, relative to, to you know, business people who have like a direct financial incentive to go and, you know, lobby or, or to shape, you know, regulatory opinions, I, 
I, I, I agree that, you know, we're not as sharply motivated to like have one, you know, have one point and try to argue that from, you know, write, write 20 papers and 20 presentations about the same very narrow um, thing necessarily. Um, and, and spend all your time kind of trying to change policy rather than, than kind of understand policy and kind of give that over to regulators. Um, but I think, yeah, so I guess I'm a little more positive. I think that, you know, in general, we do, you know, pretty good, um, a, a pretty good job. And, I, you know, from my experience from, you know, COVID, you know, having, having also written some stuff about kind of just trying to do rapid policy analysis of some things like the impacts of the stimulus program on, on consumer spending, like, you know, two weeks after the, the stimulus checks went out, um, you know, it did, I did interact a lot with, with policymakers and, you know, I wasn't as, uh, you know, I wasn't taking a, a um, you try to present a factual kind of analysis rather than some sort of, of norm review. But um, I think there were, there are a lot of policymakers that turn to, um, you know, faculty, you know, to academics like us for, you know, answers to some of those questions. Um, and whether we should like lobby more versus be more neutral, um, I think, you know, it depends on who you ask, what, what would be the optimal uh, stance. So I'll, I'll just add another two cents into the, into the bucket here. So I, I guess maybe I'm in between. I, I actually am extremely bullish and positive on quote, the potential of what we are doing to shape regulators and really inform them in a way that could be very profound because of the challenges they're facing are really difficult. You need some of the best minds to put this together, the potential. But I am only moderately proud or um, my view of the realization that we've had thus far. So with the potential is there, we have to harvest it more. And, um, you know, I, I would just encourage a lot of uh, the young researchers and those out there, First of all, I think that this area is like as central to doing this in a way that can really help policymakers almost relative to any other research area you could pick. Um, look at the, the topics we had, policy uncertainty. I mean, how could that be any less central to a decision maker? First principal component risk, recessions, understanding those, navigating them, predicting them could not be more important. And, and of course, systemic risk, all these themes that came out here, this is where we want to try to really make a profound impact. How, how can we do better is that, well, um, you know, regulators often have conferences. Um, we should go, we should share sabbaticals. I spent a year at the Securities and Exchange Commission, one of the best years ever as far as learning and and sharing, and I think we should do more of that and, and sort of integrate uh, what we're doing. I also would recommend um, applying for National Science Foundation grants um, because it actually forces you to think about broader impact of your work. You will not get the grant if you cannot explain why it's really gonna help society. And, and this is exactly the you know, one aspect of society that we really can help to do it right. So lastly, um, you know, when you're designing your research, you wanna try to share your data, your code, so that it's easy for those in regulatory agencies to just come and get it. Um, try to avoid black box. Try to you know, choose methods that are easily flexible as far as pulling more data out and, and making it easy, not hard, lowering the cost uh, for those who are in those positions to really come and, and sort of learn uh, in, from what you're doing. Well, I can't imagine better words to wrap up this session on. I want to thank all the attendees, but I very much want to thank our amazing panel. This has just been so informative in terms of not only sort of the nitty gritty of creating these measures, getting these measures published, thinking about how they mesh with theory, but the big picture of how what we're doing fits with improving the economy, talking to regulators and contributing. I think this was just really interesting. And Jerry, Scott, and Alan, thank you so much for your time today.